This episode is sponsored by the TTM Academy at Penn Medicine, an educational initiative to improve care for patients following cardiac arrest and other neurocritical care illnesses using targeted temperature management. Find out more at PennTTM.com. Hey, NCS podcast listeners, this is your host, Bawaz Mufti from Westchester Medical Center. With the rapid evolution of neurocritical care, better comprehension of the acute brain injury, as well as the relatively rapid influx of new medications, today more than ever, neurointensivists find themselves engaging and partnering with critical care pharmacists. Some sedatives, hyperosmolar agents, vasopressors, or more specifically, anti-epileptic agents, neurostimulants, or reversal agents, the pharmacotherapy of acute cerebral injury is undoubtedly complex and multifaceted. Hence, the NCS podcast decided to partner with the highly successful pharmacotherapy of neurocritical care series, The Pawns, in a limited release to cover pertinent pharmacological topics presented by experts in the field of neurocritical care. Over the course of the coming months, you will hear a number of selected Pawns talks, but please do let us know if there are particular topics you would like to be additionally covered. Without further ado, here's the pawns. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. I'm Mernas Pajamond, one of the co-chairs of the Pharmacotherapy of Neurocritical Care series, also known as PONS Subcommittee. It is a pleasure today to have Dr. Salia Farouk, a neurocritical care pharmacy specialist at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, join us to discuss her PONS presentation on neurostimulants in the neurointensive care unit. Salia will define what neurostimulants are and their pharmacological effects, explain the rationale for the use of neurostimulants in neuro-ICU patients, and briefly discuss the literature supporting the use of selected neurostimulants for specific indications in neuro-ICU patients. Salia, welcome today to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Just to get started, can you describe what neurostimulants are and how they work? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Sure, so neurostimulants are medications that are used to speed up physical and mental processes. And from the mechanism of action perspective, these medications often increase concentrations of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine in different regions of the brain. The thought is that these regions in the brain are responsible for learning, memory, arousal, target-oriented behavior, and posture and movement. So what is the role of neurostimulants in neurocritical care patients? And are there any specific subgroup of neurocritical care patients who may benefit the most? Sure. So the overall goal in neuro-ICU patients specifically is to improve arousal, wakefulness, and awareness to actually hopefully get them more involved in their therapy, such as physical therapy, ambulation, being able to get them off the ventilation, mechanical ventilation, and just like other ICUs to minimize ICU complications such as pneumonia and venous thrombosis events. There is actually some suggestion that patients with stroke and traumatic brain injury or TBI patients may benefit the most from these agents just because of the fact that these patients usually have the most extensive degree of injury and degree of disability after injury. As a matter of fact, there are some reports that TBI causes significant disability in up to 90,000 patients per year, and about 70% of stroke survivors suffer from motor deficit in their everyday life. Thanks, Salia. So what are some of the commonly used neurostimulants in this setting? It is really hard to label one or uh, one medication or a class of medication as common, uh, just because, as we'll talk shortly about the evidence, there's still a lot of, I think, limitations with the studies that we have. But um, the medications that we commonly see in our practice, at least, uh, include amantadine, methylphenidate, modafinil, and SSRIs, particularly fluoxetine. Speaking of fluoxetine, what do you think of the two studies published regarding its use in stroke, specifically the studies Flame and Focus? Sure. So taking a step back, SSRIs or uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, even before Flame, there were some studies that showed that there may be a role in motor recovery with these agents. And there's actually some MRI studies showing that a single dose of fluoxetine or paroxetine can improve sensory motor cortex. However, after these studies, I think the question of if this is beneficial is a little bit more controversial. So we'll talk about flame and focus. And I think it's important to note that these studies actually looked at different outcomes, different patient population, and they had different follow-up time as well. So flame, um, to start with flame, flame was a multi-center double-blinded placebo-controlled trial 
they had 118 patients of only ischemic stroke patients who had hemiplegia and hemoparesis. And it was mostly male, 62%. The median NIH scale was 12 in the fluoxetine group and 13 in the placebo group. And these patients actually did not have the clinical diagnosis of depression. So patients with depression were excluded. They gave um, these patients 20 milligrams of fluoxetine daily or placebo for 90 days, starting five to 10 days after the ischemic stroke. They measured fugal meyer score, which is an index of motor recovery or motor assessment in these patients. And when they adjusted that score for age and prior stroke, they found that people who received fluoxetine, they did better at day 30 and at day 90, which was the end of the study. They also noticed that uh, patients in the fluoxetine group had more independence measured by MRS score or a modified ranking scale. Now, focus was designed slightly differently. Focus included more patients. Again, it was a multi-centered, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial of over 1,500 patients. They had ischemic stroke patients and hemorrhagic patients, but more ischemic stroke patients, 90 ischemic stroke patients and about 10% ICH or hemorrhagic stroke patients. The median NI scale was actually six in the fluoxetine and the placebo group. So again, a different patient population, lower severity of stroke. And these patients, 8% in each group, did have the clinical diagnosis of depression. They looked at 6 months and 12 months after receiving fluoxetine, and their measurement for recovery was modified ranking scale, meaning the measurement of independence and their activities of daily living. When they looked at that, they, after six months of therapy versus placebo, they actually did not find any benefit with fluoxetine compared to placebo. However, they did find that the new rate of depression was reduced in the fluoxetine group, and the rate of new bone fractures was increased in the fluoxetine group. So comparing these two studies, again, very different patient populations, different follow-up time, different measurements of outcomes. I think it's it's important to note that not maybe everybody uh, after stroke should be on fluoxetine. Maybe patients who have a new diagnosis of depression, which is common after stroke, but are not at risk of bone fractures should be really targeted for um, SSRIs, particularly fluoxetine. Wow, that's really interesting information. So what about the other agents you just mentioned? Is the evidence promising? So the other agents, I think we can start with amantadine. Amantadine was initially marketed as an antiviral agent, not that it's used for that indication anymore, because it has an MD antagonist effect and it does inhibit the reuptake of dopamine. It makes sense that it could be used as a neurostimulation. The major trials that are done with amantadine are really in TBI patients. One study I think is particularly uh, relevant to our patient population. It was done in ICU patients. It was a retrospective study with only 74 patients. So again, putting it, putting it into perspective, it was small and it was retrospective. But when they gave amantadine IV, which is not available in the U.S. Uh, at this point, when they did 200 milligrams IV of amantadine BID versus placebo, Patients who receive amantadine actually had better GCS and they had lower mortality, and these were all severe TBI patients with initial GCS of less than eight. The other study that w- that's a newer study done in 2012, that was a rehab study that they gave amantadine 100Q12, they titrated the dose based on the disability scale, and they went up to 200 milligrams Q12 versus placebo, and what they found was that amantadine helped with speeding up the recovery time during the active phase of treatment, but then when they stopped the medication and they followed patients for two weeks, actually the rate of recovery was similar. So again, maybe there is a role, but the rehab study that started in the rehab setting, not in the IC setting, suggested that uh, only in the active phase of treatment we see the most benefit. Going to methylphenidate, methylphenidate also has one specific study in the ICU setting, which I thought was interesting. And in that study, they actually gave doses up to 20 milligrams BID, and they found that ICU and hospital length of stay was reduced in severe TBI cases. In non-ICU patients, they also looked at methylphenidate um, in TBI patients, and they looked at fatigue scores. And they found dose-dependent benefit, meaning that when they looked at no methylphenidate versus low methylphenidate and low methylphenidate versus normal methylphenidate dosing, there was evidently some dose-related benefit. And the doses that they looked at, it ranged from low dose of 5 milligrams up to 60 milligrams, which was the max dose in those studies per day. 
I said, there may be some role with methylphenidate, and I think the biggest take-home message from those studies was that dose-dependent effect has been clear in those studies, and this is something for clinicians to keep in mind and to be aware of. Lastly, modafinil. I think modafinil is, is interesting because its mechanism of action is not really clear. There's no real effect on dopamine or norepinephrine. We think that the hypothesis is that it may actually inhibit catecholamine transporters. It may also decrease GABA-mediated neurotransmission. Modafinil has studies in TBI and ischemic stroke. In TBI, there is one study in ICU, again, kind of related to our patient population, and they found that in patients mild to severe TBI, all kind of, you know, levels of TBI or severity of TBI, modafinil improved excessive daytime sleepiness, but there was no effect in fatigue. In ischemic stroke, they found some benefit. In some studies, they found no clear benefit in other studies. So I think the role of modafinil has not been established completely at this point. But a lot of these studies talked about the fact that we're still trying to find the right dose, and maybe these are the pilot studies to establish a bigger randomized control trial to see who may be the best responder to this therapy. Thank you. I mean, I have to tell you, working in neurotrauma ICU, we definitely use some of these agents, and I think it's very difficult to kind of tell what the outcomes are that we see with these patients since I don't see them beyond the ICU. So that's really interesting. Thank you. So what are some of the adverse reactions of the agents that you discussed? Yeah, so seizures definitely, given that these are all, you know, neurostimulants and they can reduce the seizure threshold is very important for us to keep in mind. Some of these patients are already at risk of seizures. And, for example, for amantadine, we know that it's dose-related. So doses uh, higher than 300 milligrams per day may be associated with higher risk of seizures. Methylphenidate specifically can also have significant cardiovascular side effects. So if somebody had a recent MI or coronary artery disease, that may not be the ideal agent. Methylphenidate, again, and modafinil, those are controlled substances. Substances. So if somebody has a history of substance abuse, those two agents may not be ideal for those patients. And what are some of the lessons we've learned from these published trials? So I think looking back at all these trials, I think the biggest take-home message here is that it is very important looking back at these trials not to compare them head-to-head. Uh, a lot of these trials actually had different study designs. They look at different outcomes. They were small in sample size. They failed to control for spontaneous recovery, and they had different treatment durations and different initiation times for when they started these patients on these agents. So everything should be really interpreted cautiously, and I think that's the biggest take-home message that all these trials are done differently, and we're hoping that maybe in the future we could potentially have better designs to compare these medications more fairly. Salia, based on your comprehensive review of the literature, what is the future direction regarding the use of these neurostimulants? Yeah, I think, honestly, I believe that a lot of the studies, when they looked at these patients and these medications, the biggest question that I think is a million-dollar question is that which patient population is the optimal responder? And I think that is going to be the future of these trials to focus on the patients that may benefit the most to target those patients. In addition, given that different pathways are usually involved in these, in these injuries, maybe there is no magical medication. Maybe we should start thinking about combination of medications as opposed to one medication. Obviously, we have to think about side effects and drug-drug interactions when more than one medication is involved, but I think that we may have been looking for one specific medication, but knowing that different pathways and different injuries are involved, that may not be really the ultimate response. Salia, thank you so much for offering your expertise. This was very interesting. And sure. are you aware of any large randomized trials that are ongoing evaluating these? Not to my knowledge, anything that is, I think, bigger than focus. I don't believe so. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. The NCS Podcast Series is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Bawaz Mufti, Lamani Baloo, Mike Brogan, Josh Levine, Benjamin Miller, Sterane Shepard, Jim Siegler, Sarah Stonezer, and Chris Zamet. Our senior producer is Bonnie Rousseau. 
Our administrative staff includes Bonnie Rousseau, Angel Gindel, Sarah Mimin, and Becca Stigman. Music is created by Mohan Katapali from the Division of Neurocritical Care at the University of Miami. The NCS Podcast Series is available on NCS On Demand and wherever you may listen to your podcast. For more information, please follow us on Twitter at Neurocritical or on Facebook. I'm Fawad al and thanks for listening.